the right tone for the technical sessions to follow. So on behalf of uh, all here, I welcome Dr. Naresh Trehan, uh, who in spite of his very busy schedule could uh, come here. So, and he, he is here at a very right uh, time. Now I request Dr. Trehan to please uh, give his presidential remarks. Dr. Trehan, please. Thank you, Dr. Bedi. Uh, presidential is a very lofty word for a person who is totally ignorant. I'm probably the most ignorant man in this room about what I'm going to talk about. So this subject by itself is very, very deeply embedded in my mind. So the starting point is that I have a strong belief that I practice the highest end of modern medicine. And the parts of modern medicine are that it is standardized mostly, effective most of the time, very invasive because we know only three things, either to poison or to cut it out or shoot it with the most powerful radiation that we can find, and very expensive. So if we keep those three things in mind, we now have to also evaluate that the creators of the medicine, that be USA, and I must welcome Dr. Walker, sorry. And uh, do I see Dr. Professor Ganguly is not here anymore? He left. He left, okay. And I see Ram Vishwas. So the worst part of modern medicine is that the creators of this medicine cannot afford it for their own populations, and that be USA, Europe, and UK. I was recently at UK in, in Cardiff where they, by mistake, gave me the Lifetime Achievement Award. But in that, the subject was how to reduce the budget of NHS, which is 100 billion pounds today for 55 million people, by 20 billion people, so they want 20 billion pounds. So that means they want to reduce it by 20 percent. Similarly, you know Obamacare is always in controversy, and Europe, if you look at their social security programs, most of them are going to go bankrupt by 2017 to 2020. So that leaves us, brings us home. That means the medicine that we are practicing will never touch about 70 to 80 percent of our population the way we feel proud of doing it. And not only it doesn't stop there, because there are 4 billion of us. It's not only 1.2 billion in India, but we are talking about Africa. I just was there last week. And they are even in worse shape than we are in. And then Southeast Asia and CIS countries and so on and so forth. So if you look at it, there are two ways. One, it's a tragedy. The other way, it's a challenge and an opportunity. What we need to do, this is my mind, and I know very little about it, it's in my mind, is that where we have must have a huge wealth hidden or buried in alternate medicines that we call alternate, but they were really medicines on the, in their own right, and maybe modern medicine is alternate to those that lived for 5,000 years that how do we bring out the gems hidden in them in a more scientific manner? And the limitation that there is from our end is that we want to apply the same yardstick of scientific validation to other sciences also where there may be no similarity. They must develop their own yardsticks and we should not measure it against us. But it is for you to say, this is the yardstick, this is what establishes safety, this is what establishes reproducibility, this is what establishes the efficacy. On the other hand, we know that there are many gaps in, our, in modern medicine. We, one was rheumatology, as you talked about, uh, gastrointestinal problems, uh, diabetes. There are many, many gaps where we are actually not as effective as we should be and, and also the treatments like cholesterol and high cholesterol and all that, statins have their own side effects. You can't put people on statins for life and not expect some sort of, uh, some sort of side effects to develop. So I'm saying that if we can 
bring into convergence after proper validation, whichever method it may be, and look at the strengths of allopathy and the strengths of that and bring them into convergence. To be able to, I, the crudest example that comes to mind is strep throat. So we know that we will now give amoxicillin for a strep throat, give it 500 milligrams three times a day, 99% of the people will get better, 1% will get, uh, may not. The about 5 to 7 percent will get some sort of side effects, maybe 30 percent will give, get gastrointestinal upset, 1 percent or maybe less will get develop some sort of Stephen Johnson kind of syndrome, but 100 percent will have a hole in their pocket. So we as practitioners of modern medicine live by the belief, you have a disease, we'll fix it for you. You don't have to do anything, you just give us your money and we'll fix it. Whereas I, in my limited understanding is that the way medicine was practiced and kept this world alive for 5,000 or whatever thousand years is to say, if the body has been invaded by a disease, let us reinforce the strength of the body to fight the disease. This is one principle, right? So if that be so, then there is a logical, and this is all simple-minded stuff, so please pardon me for being, being limited and stupid, but this is a belief that if we were to combine the power of two is to say we use an other form of medicine which will boost the immune system to a level where half a dose of amoxicillin may suffice because Ayurveda or homeopathy itself may not suffice because then the success rates as I understand it are not as predictable as with amoxicillin then maybe if we can combine the two then and find the same result or better result, half the side effects and half the cost, we may have actually produced what the world needs today. And I, that's why I said what America, US, uh, UK and Europe is to us today, we can be to the four billion people. This is an opportunity. This is a tremendous opportunity for India. Like we did in IT, there's no reason why we can't do it here. And other people can't because they don't have that wealth of knowledge and work done and what you just demonstrated here in, uh, in one lecture, I'm sure all day you'll, you'll demonstrate many other things. But where is that convergence? Where is that meeting point is what my obsession is. And that's why you know Gita and we've been working together for many, many years. And I keep berating him that you are becoming a Ayurveda Shala, not a real researcher to say where are we going. But then we were fortunate love, Dr. Ram, uh, we met with him, IIM has been, has wealth, now Dr. Kazi, and I'm sure Dr. Walker is here. So my, I would leave you with the thought that we are willing from Medanta and me personally to stake a lot on this idea. How we take it to the next step is the, is the challenge in my mind. And you may say, you say, you're talking nonsense. Ayurveda can do everything. Forget about your medicine and go back to school. I'm even willing to accept that if somebody will demonstrate it to me. But I think that there is a wealth in all these forms of science and medicine. We just need to find the translational efficacy of this whole thing. So if by the end of the day or whenever two days the conference is on, if you can constitute a core group, we just push us this idea, give ourselves six months and say we will just discuss the way forward and if we can find a common pathway, I'd be very happy to, I don't think there's a limitation once we have that thought in our mind or we have worked out some way forward, which I'm, I don't have any idea about, I just have that obsession and resources can be mobilized, human capital can be mobilized, physical structure can be provided, but this needs to be distilled in my mind because I see if we miss this opportunity, we would have lost because China, I think, is 10 years behind us, if not 20 years behind us in modern medicine. There's nobody else in this world who can match us with the, with the expertise that we have. 
and nobody can match us with the traditional medicines that we have. So it's logical. Have I have I made my point strong enough so I can stop talking? Because I know time, time and and patience is an exhaustible commodity. So I'll take your leave. Thank you very much.